Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to oxum.substack.com or patreon.com slash oxum or join the YouTube channel directly at even five or one dollar a month. Today, our guest is Tadios Tebabu. Welcome to the program, Diakon. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for having me, Dick and Enoch. Glad to be here. Me too. You know, I um, I I like to dwell on names. I don't give too much credence to them. But as someone familiar with Giz, I know you know uh, there's a funny thing going on with names. Even, for example, um, as is the simplest example that I like to give people, is one of the words that people translate as magic from Giz to English is Asmat. And as both you and I know, Asmat is simply the plural of the word name. It means names. So we see in the Sa'atat, or the Liturgy of Hours tradition we're going to be talking about, for example, where they talk about Salastu Asmat. And it's not the three magic, but it's the three names, Ab, Weldin, Manifest, Kutus, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so uh, people essentialize certain words, um, I think, as an influence of Plato, not realizing they have a function. And each word kind of has its own context. I'm curious. I have your book of prayer here that I'm going to show everyone. And we're going to talk about extensively. Beautifully on the side in, in the script, it says, Mas'afas um, Alot. I'm curious, though. I didn't find your name in this book. Maybe I, I missed it. Could you tell me, uh, growing up, whether back home in Ethiopia or in Canada, uh, what people think of your name, you know, associated with the uh, apostle, right? Or or, or maybe a, a later uh, Christian that I don't know about, like a martyr. And then also, uh, where is your name in this wonderful book that you made? Um, I will I will start by my name. So one of the things is that uh, I like how you mentioned uh, that we have like some view of names. So when you say like asthma, is like has like, there's a name by itself. And there's like connotation that people assign to it, which is not related to his name, to, to the to the actual word itself. And that was that was actually interesting. And I just I just want to say it one more time. <laughs> and um, in terms of my name, is like I was named after um, Thaddeus, which is uh, the one of the twelve apostles. And so in Giz, it would be Thaddeus. So that that's how we say it in Giz. And like you know, you you know that the twelve apostles all of them have like Greek name that Hellenistic era, but so one of the Greek came out saints. And also we have a lot of saints, uh, for example, uh, Abu Nathari was a Salalish. That's one of the saints. Um, I believe he was one of the disciples of Saint Climanus, uh, but don't quote me on that. So one of the saints in our church. And we have, I, I'm not sure if we have a church for uh, Thaddeus the Apostle. I've never heard of such church in Ethiopia. But I have seen a church uh, by Abuna Tariyoz Zalalish, which is like a later day saint. So going back to the book, so one of the projects was that um, it was it was it was a little bit tricky. Uh, so none of it is I didn't write any of it, right? So who do you assign authorship to, right? So in this book, you have prayers that are dating way back to like the second or third century, like the Kidam prayer, the Covenant prayer. And in later saints like uh, Bardiogis as Augusta, which is 14th century, right? So you have so many of the saints. It's just like we just translated and made it available for for people who don't speak, who don't speak like the original language. So it was kind of tricky. Like I had to think about it twice before putting any name. But um, so finally, like we kind of, I decided to just give it to our bishop. Uh, his name is uh, Abuna Dimitros. Uh, bishop, the general bishop of the Eastern Diocese of Canada. So we kind of uh, met him when he's when he's come to Los Angeles before. Yeah, he's one of the most humble, very sweet uh, bishops that I have ever met so far. So so we kind of dedicated to him. But um, so that's that's the idea behind it. So it's just the authors are just we already know the authors, so there's no. It would be like dup duplication if someone would be written an artist. So I, yeah. I I know what you're saying. It's not, um, you know, 
Masafa Makbib, or the book of Ecclesiastes, or the scroll of Ecclesiastes, tells us there's nothing new under the sun. And so in that sense, yes, you weren't doing something original. At the same time, this is a new product. Uh, you know, a shout out to the Archdeacon Tesfa Mikhail, who's also, he's been on the show, he's a fan of the show as well. And he's had his own prayer book, but I remember when I had him on the program, I try to get uh, to send people so they can, um, you know, help support his cause. But a lot, a lot of the books they were selling personally, uh, physically in, um, out, of, out of London. And so I, I posted online for you. I don't know if you saw that on, on Twitter. We got about uh, 5,000 views, four retweets, and 93 likes. And we sent a few faranjuch that uh, in the United States and in Canada to already go in and, and get your, your book because you've put it on Amazon. So it's kind of more widely uh, available for people. You know, a lot of times we do just kind of sell things locally. So it's, it's nice. And I think it's... Uh, it's an adaptation. It shows uh, Zamanun and Dawajek that you're you're redeeming this current age by using the the technology for the the glory of God. But there's also this history in the church, and and I'm, I wonder if you could relate it to that as well. Like the the original thing you are doing is you're translating it, you're interpreting it. But um, there's this kind of history of of all this authorship and pseudo authorship both in, in our church and in others, whether we're talking about the liturgies, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, books of scripture or definitely uh, even much, much uh, works of much lesser value. The whole question of, of authorship in Ethiopian studies or, or studies is difficult. I, I wonder if you've had any different views on that since whenever you were, you know, a kid in the church until the point that you've come to now where you've been digging your, yourself into these works. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. And uh, I would say when we were growing up as a kid, every book has an author. So you would be like reading a Gadassi book and there's, a, there's an author for it. And not even just that, like, even the books that really, really like sound local, like you had books that have like your culture like embedded to them. So even those books have like authors from like, you know, the fathers from Cappadocian fathers, or it could be like Alexandrian fathers. But as you grow up, like there's more, there's, there's more work done to those works. Like you kind of realize that our fathers are like really, really humble. And there's that like humility aspect of it. Like, who am I to put my name on this book? But which is, which is not something I did. Like this is, <laughs> this is not, this is, that's not the reason why we did it, but it's just dedicated. Everyone knows who, who compiled it, but it was just a dedication to our diocese. But, our fathers are like known to be very humble and put names into put like the saints name the saints they love uh their works are dedicated to them like this is this is also like common for our liturgy and common for a lot of the works uh one of the one of the interesting uh thing is that like, i'm glad you mentioned it earlier uh one of, one of the prayers by about your like there, we have like two prayers from him in this book um one is um the blessed be the Lord, Itavara uh, Xavier, which is two a.m. prayer in his uh, full twenty-four hour cycle, um, book of hours, and 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 those prayers that you can see about about George, and those prayers are like compiled by him. Like we have already like original manuscript that he already wrote in in his own hands, right? So. For like around two hundred years ago, someone actually made a copy, and there were like some some little bit of modifications in terms of when to use this, when to use that, like a little bit of reorganizing. Even those people who did like reorganizing, like some of little bit of translation, like in addition to him, they didn't write their names. <laughs> <laughs> they like on the back of it, like on the back of the manuscript, when you go, when you scroll down, it says like, I am, I'm someone who's like, who's a sinner, like who should not be doing this work, but I have did it. So I'm like, I was, I was, I was like commissioned by the king, whatever, whatever. If you don't see their names, it's just probably like three people, four people, or adapters, and none of it is like mentioned. And, and it's just very, very common for many of our um, our books. And then not just that, like even really proper translations. Our fathers, uh, they translate book from Arabic, and they find out at some point, be like, oh, this book is originally in Syriac, and they they find like some missing link, and they send someone from Ethiopia down to Syria, all the way up to Syria. And then someone would investigate whatever and they feel out like whatever is left from that work. Even that much work, they, they do that much work. And at the end of the day, we're like, oh, I'm just a sinner. 
I can't put my name on this word. So it's just it, it's been it's been a tradition, and I, I think a lot of it comes from unity. A lot of it comes from really reverence to the church, reverence for the the, the saints. Yeah, I, I I agree with you, and in fact, it was my perspective for a long time. I was doing a lot of early translations as early as 2012 and 2013, just for local stuff, like. For our local church, I did kind of our own. I never sold it or anything, but I had some like the daily prayers done and and, uh, and other little common prayers that we would do. Um, and I wasn't putting my my name on anything or trying to edit, you know, the liturgy or something like that. And I remember one of the uh, we have several adult converts. Uh, you know, they're usually Rastafarian, but they, they come from different backgrounds in Los Angeles. And I remember uh, one of them who's a very interesting guy from uh, the country of Panama too. So, you know, you have a, an uh, Afro, clearly an Afro man, but who speaks Spanish. And he's also in the, in the Ethiopian Orthodox church. And he was telling me, Deacon Henok, you, you, um, you are very humble and, and, you know, to call yourself a sinner and, you know, you're not uh, putting yourself out there. You're not putting your name in the stars, like the, the error of the humans that were involved in the tower of Babel, right? Is they're trying to spread their own reputation. He's like, but from another perspective, he said, you also lack accountability because if there's anything wrong in the translation or in the, in the manuscript, who, who can you hold accountable? Do you, do you think accountability has, uh, any any part of this puzzle it because it is funny it's it's like i think he had a totally different cultural perspective than than the ethiopian one i was used to at uh, uh, up until that point yeah like that's that's a very valid point i would say and um you have this aspect of of you translating something from years which existed for more than like 3500 years so years more than that right and in many forms at the beginning and but for for a very great uh, for the longest time, it 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 existed like in very like consistent form, right? And then you're doing that, you're translating that language to English, right? So there's gonna be a lot of revisions. There's gonna be a lot of uh, critics that 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 are gonna be you know enhancing your work. So even you can take like for example the Orthodox Bible that uh, you know the Eastern Orthodox did. There is a lot of criticism to that book. Yeah. Like it's not that published by the Protestant company Thomas Nelson. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I mean, we can't afford it, so we can just. <laughs> that, that's fine. We can just we can just take them off the hook off the hook for that. But <laughs> but in terms of the actual text, like there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of criticism for that, and we expect we expect them to do like 2.0 uh, for the mm -hmm. Bible. And from that angle, like putting yourself out there and be like, I want, I want you to go through this book and tell me, give me like honest, constructive, like criticism, right? And then like, how can I enhance this book? How can I be very close to like what our fathers uh, gave to us, right? This is what our fathers did too. Like in many manuscripts, you have like, uh, for example, I remember someone saying, um and museums and like outside of Ethiopia, inside of Ethiopia, uh, monasteries, we have over two hundred thousand uh manuscripts. Wow. Of actual parchments, more than two hundred thousand. Probably people have gone through like probably you can say a thousand. Like even that's stretching it, way, way stretching it. But a lot of it is just a copy. A lot of it is like a lot of copy stuff, one book. So for example, for Saint the Client, he's he's got you find a lot of copies of his letter, right? So it gets updated, like especially in the, for translative works. You have the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. When they find a new copy, for example, uh, written in Arabic or written in, you can say, like uh, maybe Greek or Syriac, when they find a new copy, they make another copy. They they modify the translation. Like the work is like very dynamic in our church. That's how we end up with like more than 200,000. Uh, copies of like a lot of manuscripts and even before that like we had like so many destruction like you can assume we probably had like millions of like manuscripts so it's just our tradition and we can it, it's good to to actually like get that tradition going in the western nations too right we put this book out for mm -hmm. people for, for people to their hands so we can make it like a public public project right there's going to be a lot of people better than me definitely better than me can do uh, a lot of good work. So putting your name out for that reason is actually a good reason. I would say it's a very valid reason. 
Well, well said, and a very good point on the the manuscripts. In fact, uh, I keep waiting for it to come out. But a friend of mine who's been a friend of the program, Deacon Adam Asilasi in Washington D.C., he has his uh, book coming out that is the the letter kills, but the um, the tirigwami or the interpretation gives life, which is a, a phrase commonly used, taken from the Pauline language, about the the biblical school of exegesis in Aksum. And that's our Mazaf Beit, our Tiraguami Beit. And so he's he's done a, a book reviewing all the literature of that and then contributing to that literature. We're waiting for it to come out later this year, but he makes that point in his book as well that they were, in a sense, open-minded in a way that people who are maybe not actively working with manuscripts don't understand. Like you just said, there are like you know 200 versions of the hagiography of St. Takla Haimanot. You say that to the average St. Takla Haimanot fan, and they might call you an enemy of St. Takla Haimanot to say that there's not just one, you know, one version that drops from the sky. So this understanding that there's like a an editing process and even maybe a, a, a critical review of how rigorous that editing process is. And especially, guess what? For centuries, that editing process happened without a functioning Holy Synod. So now we have a Holy Synod and we can start uh, continuing that editing process. Also, so also realizing that there's no clear final point of editing. As long as you have a Holy Synod and you're not editing dogma, anything else can be edited by the Holy Synod. And I think it's something that, that people don't understand. But you who have worked with these, you know, thousands of manuscripts that are out there, I've seen a little bit at the Library of Congress, the British Museum, uh, St. Catherine's uh, Monastery in the Sinai, which uh, you know, I'm currently uh, going through Graham Hancock's The Sign and the Seal, this old book from the 90s. And he talks about that monastery for his own reasons. But it's like a lot of different places that have digitized. There's the place in, uh, is it St. John's, where Professor Getacho Haile of Blessed Memory uh, you had had so many manuscripts that, that we work on. So th that was really well said. And it's not just his Beatitude of Buena Dimitros that we see of Canada in here. We also see the patriarch, who I'm, I'm not so sure if you are His Holiness Abba Matthias, if you have any relationship, but also uh, the archpriest uh, Misale, who has probably the most, uh, if there's a, a graph of oldest priests to best English that I've encountered uh, of Ethiopians, it's probably uh, archpriest uh, Misale. I, I used to meet him in Oakland when he would visit Abu Namalka, his beatitude Abu Namalka's edict. And uh, also our, our mutual father, Father Mabratu, as well, who has written extensively in English and in Amharic as well. Is there anything you could say about Lika Khanat Masale and Asis Mabratu um, in, in their contribution to your faith or into this book? Um, yeah, I, I, before I go into that, like, I, I, just, I just want to make one point. I don't want to get, uh, get uh, out of context, especially like when we have different versions of hagiographies. I uh, just want to just one quick point. Um, so whenever like this writing process happens, is that um, especially for our saints, usually it happens like right after they die because mm -hmm. they want them to write about it themselves when they're alive. So like you have zero idea how 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 holy they are like when they're alive, right? When they die, everything starts to rebel. So that's that's also like a power of God, right? There is God's hand on it, and by his by his power, he gives them this like shield of people not finding out about themselves. So that that goes for every saint, the climb of the saint, the climb of every saint. So the writing process right after is after that. So it's, in some manuscripts, you find the writing process to be like, oh, ab buruk ab the of like our father the climb which kind of suggests that is written by, for example, his disciples, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like some manuscript may say like oh how weird like my brother like maybe like someone lived parallel to that to to that monk or to that saint right so you have that writing process but once something is out there right once something is out there there's going to be people coming to 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 give like testimony about that saint right right so not, don't just include what you guys already uh have done so far but i have this testimony i have i have this personal thing that Saint Claremont did for me. So that's gonna be included in the coming like versions or whatever, right? So it's gonna get more like enhanced in a way that it's it's very inclusive or in, it's very like comprehensive of different stories, different miracles, and different uh, testimonies that the thing had. 
So that's why like it keeps getting edited, it keeps getting edited, it keeps getting bigger, larger and larger. Mm-hmm. Especially for someone like Santa Clarimon, who reached the four corners of the Ethiopian land, pretty much. His influence is not just in Ethiopia, it's in, in, in the Coptic Church yes. and in the other churches, right? He has his 12 disciples that pretty much preached re preach Ethiopia and establish so many mon- monasteries. So you get like a lot of stories about him, like after he, he passed away, after he passed to heaven. Like so so many, so many stories come down. So that's why I say like this, there's there's a lot of editing process because they're not just someone, they're 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 very like they're very humble and they're very they want they want the best for that sin. And they want the best for the church. To have like the, the most comprehensive story or hagiography of that person. Very, very good. And um, could you add to that any contributions Archpriest Masali and Father Mabratu have uh, helped you with in this project or in or in anything, the faith and spiritual wise, spirituality wise? Yeah, definitely. So um, when uh, when when this project started, this project is uh, part of like a bigger project. So this is like the smaller one, like just like something to 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 give people because we have like a very dire shortage of like actual English content, English work. Mm-hmm. Like I always, I'm always embarrassed um, because uh, we, I know we have like a lot of problems and, and a lot of, a lot of new immigration. We're not like the Greeks or like, you know, Italians like coming to West and establish for uh, God knows how long for them. But hundred plus like, years, yeah. hundred plus years more, yeah, definitely. And but we have like really like very dynamic immigration going on from Ethiopia. So the church is always like the people who don't speak Amharic or who don't speak Tigrinya or any other local language are always dominated by people who who know the culture, who speak the language. So the service doesn't grow more than like what is what is given in Ethiopia, right? It's it's almost like similar level. So you have that problem. So because of that, like you don't have like a lot of publications targeted to people who, who just understand English, right? So this book, uh, we have this uh, this this project that um, that we're working on on about Yogi Zagasja. So about Yogi Zagasja wrote this um, this uh, book of hours. So it's 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 different in a way that it covers twenty four hours of the day. Uh, and our church used to do, um, used to have the, the Coptic Book of Hours before that. So that's the t- tradition that we heard. Um, if you read, I think, Robert Taft, he lists out like four different uh, heart, uh, Book of Hours that our church used. So one of the four is about yogis. So we still use his his, um, his Book of Hours, but in much shorter way and in an in, in updated way, like updated by later scholars or saints. So we have that project that to to bring that project to light in, in English, also in Amharic, also in Giz, and the three language. So hopefully more language in the future. But right now that's the project. And this book came out out of that project. So what you have in the morning prayer is that in our church, the because we don't do like the 24 hour cycles of our Gyorgis Augusta prayer, mm-hmm. book of hours, some of the prayers from, from the nighttime, they migrated over to the morning. Right, because we have, for example, I have it over here. We have the, the shorter version of Book of Hours. So this is mm-hmm. like our Book of Hours. Must have a sad, sad, sad book hours. And this is not the twenty-four hour version. No, this is definitely not the twenty-four hour version. So what we have in the church, this is what we have in the church right now, the modern church. And but what you what we used to have is that the whole twenty-four hour cycle, and some of the prayers from, for example, two a.m., one a.m. From midnight to 4 a.m., they got like squished over and they become our book of hours. But the other part of the prayer is um, is not is not prayer is not is not you know in service anymore. Like I would say, and I know some churches do that. For example, Devil Work, and I don't know where that is. Probably good job Devil Work. They still maintain the 24 hours 24 hour cycle prayers. They do the all the 24 hours. Yeah, wow, I've never heard of that. that. Uh, it's what, just, uh, do you know what melody tradition they use? 
So, like, uh, is it the Sadat Kulla of of uh, the Sadat Kulla Mikhail Church from Wello or Beit Amhara, or is it the uh, either the upper house or lower house of Dabrabai? That would be very interesting to know. I would say lower house because uh, I mean, don't quote me on this on geography, but I thought Gojam is more lower house than like upper house, right? So to be honest, be... I don't know what Gojam does for Kedase. I know for for Dugwa and uh, Akwakwam, they have their tradition of Ume and um, Achaber, but I actually was not aware of what they do. I don't know what they do for the for the Eucharistic liturgy. Or, or even for the the liturgy of hours that you're talking about, I I would say that uh, more of the liturgy of hours in general, like this liturgy school of theology, <laughs> liturgy school is uh, is dominated by Deborah Ampai, like mm -hmm. almost almost entire entire in, in in the entire country. So even Saron Kula uh, are like they're like minor traditions. So I would I would go with like Deborah Ampai. That would be my educated guess. Um, but anyhow, so some of the prayers that got squished, and this this comes out from that that wider project. Mm -hmm. And so when we are doing a project, that uh, we kind of notice that like there's there's nothing, there's almost nothing for people to use as a prayer, and we just had like this pocket version of book of prayer for people to use. Have like this common prayers that we we pray, and also morning and night prayer. So. Kassis Mabrat, the role of Kassis Mabrat was like, it, it was, there was a lot of editing. There was a lot of back and forth, you know, like you want, you want to ask people, people's, uh, people's opinion and people's, it just, you know, looking over for you. And sometimes, um, you don't see, wait, you don't see your own bias. Um, and you want people to, to notice it for you. And there's, there was a lot of, um, really good uh feedback that i got from kasis Mabratu. so that's why his name is his, his name is on there and uh lika khana uh our lika khana stalin he is the the secretary for general administrator of the eastern canada diocese so he's also we have his blessing and abuna dimitros blessing his grace abuna dimitros blessing so that's all like they got included in the project and if it wasn't with their prayer and you know with their blessing, like this wouldn't happen. So I'm really, I'm really glad for them. Be thankful for their, you know, very positive and uh, all the things they did. Thank you. That yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and I'm so glad they helped inspire a young scholar like you. Um, if there's one problem I talk about in the church is like people not collaborating enough. You know, even now I, I mentioned Deacon Tasfa Mikhail. If we had a and I know we have so many other problems, but if we had a synodal English language initiative, the, the synod would have you and Deacon Tasfa Mikhail and maybe me, you know, working on things like this and we'd have more standardization. But I want to go back to what you said, because what you're talking about in the different manuscript traditions of the various books of ours or or the liturgy of ours, um, what's fascinating is you have the Coptic one, which is the original one that you're talking about. You have the 24-hour version of Abba Georgis, as you mentioned. Then you have the one that we have in use today. And even then, I'd like to, to mention this. A good friend of mine who taught me a lot about the Liturgy of Hours is a friend of the show, Deacon Mahari Zamalak. And at his parish at Mikael in uh, Mercato in Addis Ababa, he told me he grew up doing the kind of... Um, the four hour variety that you're saying, where the, the first two hours are kind of portions of the 24 hour but the other two as you said come from later writers my understanding of the church because i was never born and raised in ethiopia is mostly in uh, los angeles and as far as i know i've heard of basically one parish in southern california um doing this regularly and then other parishes doing it during Filseta, during the 16 day fast of our our lady the holy virgin mary's assumption but other than that, I don't hear people in the United States, maybe Canada's different, doing the even what they call the full version of Sa'atat is not the 24 hours, but let alone the 24 hours, like the four hours. Instead, what I see is most places do kind of the, the later writings that may or may not you know, be attributable to Abba Georgis that are not a part of the 24 hours. And you know the things like uh, um, 
Melkasil, Tafasi Mariam, these things that are in the, the latter part of the four hour uh, book, the, the, the one that you that you showed the audience for those who are watching in addition to, to listening. And so I, I wonder at your own uh, parishes that you serve in the Toronto area, are you guys doing the full, I want to say full, not obviously not, I don't, I assume you're not doing the 24 hours, but are you doing even like four hours? Are you doing like 2 a.m. to 6 a.m.? Or are you are you starting at some time like 5 a.m. or 4.30 a.m. and doing the sort of the last part of the four hour version? Um, well, uh, for our parish, I would say uh, a, lot of, a lot of the parishes, they don't have like enough servants. So, uh, mostly like especially like when you go out of toronto like the wider toronto area maybe it's just one priest and there's like some deacons or like students probably and it's just it's just very difficult and it it, it takes it requires like a lot of labor to actually do the, the sata even what we have in the contemporary church in the modern church but and and one of the cathedrals in toronto the saint mary cathedral we have uh i think uh, his name is Barkiros, he's he's from like Debra by like the one of the uh, creating monastery for the school of liturgy in Ethiopia. So school of liturgy like it includes the fourteen liturgies of our Eucharistic liturgies. It also includes the Saata or like Book of Hours. So he's he he's a, he's a teacher. He's qualified to teach this. And for full setup, he he uh, he does the Saata. So he starts from, you know, Atif, which is on a bar, a bar Jewish version, um, a bar Jewish version is the midnight prayer. It starts from the midnight. And usually like when we, when we go on to like later scholar editions, that's around 4 a.m. So from midnight to 4 a.m. is the one we do in the church. And then after 4 a.m. Is, is more of like additions from other scholars, right? And so that's what we have in Toronto, but that that's what you have exactly, and even in Ethiopia, in the motherland. I know some churches in the monasteries, they do the full sata, not the 24 hours, but what we have right now from midnight to 4 a.m. and some additions by later scholars. And the monasteries is every day. Like if you go to Wabdaba, if you go to like actual, um, there's, there's monasteries, like just every day, it's every day thing, but, or even in Addis, where they have like 35 priests in one parish, um, what they do is only for the uh, full setup. So it is it is kind of sad actually, like how how we well we only use it for full setup, like not use it for like you know the whole year, right? Abagiogis has this for every hour for for every day, and also we have like a special special another 48 hour. Um, for the Sabbath, it wow. starts from the Friday. Like it starts from Friday evening, and then it's continuous until like Monday morning, nine a.m. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, he has. It's just it's not just one. It's just two. Like one is like for everyday service, which is like twenty four hours, and he finishes by um, by his prayer. One of his prayers that he writes, uh, he he wrote is that uh, Xavier Nessa, which is the God enthroned. Like beautiful, beautiful prayer, and then it continues on to have like a second version. I wouldn't say version, but I, I would say like it, 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 like a second version only uh, dedicated for the Sabbath. So like Ethiopian Sabbath is like a unique Sabbath, which starts from just like the uh, the just like the Jews. It starts from the evening of Saturday, and it finishes off by like around midday on on Sunday like after liturgy. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and in fact, Deacon Mahari and I, uh, shameless plug, uh, will be having coming out in a journal later this year. They haven't given me a date yet. We found an Ethiopic or a Gu'uz diatessaron, or a smashing up of the four Gospels, as they used to do in the early church, incorrectly in my opinion, but it's still fascinating enough. And like you, it was a mini project within the larger product of translating a Sa'atat except the Sa'atat we found are none of the ones you and I have mentioned so far. It's uh, it's dated by the people who digitized it sometime in the 1300s, but we believe it's much older. 
and it's a uh, it's a random guy named uh, Abba. I think uh, Alamentos is is what he called himself, or he has his uh, baptismal name in the manuscript as well. And like you said, he just calls himself a sinner. But it's not Abba Georgis, and it is an Ethiopian. It's a good uh, manuscript from Saint Catherine of of Sinai that that we found and and we had been working on as well. So I'm I'm so glad that you're you're in this field going to uh, talk about the kind of way that it's lived out again a little more. I wonder, do you have any experience with the aquaquam or the the other uh, instrumental, extremely, this is a, the, the liturgy of ours is a non-instrumental and a non-Eucharistic liturgy, although it's connected to the house of the Eucharistic liturgy, as you said. We have the aquaquam tradition, which is also non-Eucharistic, except it's extremely instrumental counter to the the Sa'atat tradition. And what I have seen sometimes, again, I haven't experienced this in the diaspora, but from hearing stories from people, from talking to others, I hear that there are some parishes where they don't just choose between them, but they do both at the same time at different types of different parts of the parish. I wonder if you've ever seen that and and what you what your thoughts are of that. Because mine mine are not the most positive from, from what I think, but I wonder what you what you make of that. Yeah, I, I, this is the, uh, I, this can be like a little bit introvert, uh, controversial. And I would say, um, uh, for, I, I think there is traditions that our fathers uh, handed down to us, right? Um, traditions, whenever like they create something, or whenever they create something, they say, this book of ours. And it's not just like the writing, it's not just the letter, like you say, like there's a spirit behind it. The spirit is the tradition, right? So how you're gonna use it, how people are gonna be experiencing it, it's gonna be passed on by tradition, right? Um, and not just for Abba George or Abba Georgis, it just, it, it goes for St. Yared and a lot of scholars that came after him. So whenever they do something, there's something tradition that, that goes with it. So. What comes along is that because our church experienced so so much prosecution in the past, you have Grand Yahmed, you have Yodi Gurid, right? And you have a lot of that. And but by, by the grace of God, you get like saints like Amen. Saint Aglaimon and everyone um that that God got brings to our church and like kind of like recreates the church. But what you have is that there's gonna be like a little bit of like discontinuity between the, the actual letter itself. And the tradition. Mm -hmm. So what you get is that you get like pseudo traditions, right? There's some sort of pseudo traditions which are not ascribed by the original authors. That's not their intent, right? I don't think that when Abba George writes his sadat, he wants to like overpower what's already going on in the Mahdi. Mm -hmm. right? He doesn't want something overlapping. Like there is already like a tradition for that. So we kind of have to actually read through like the pseudo traditions and go back to like how they were supposed to be uh, done in the church, how how we are supposed to celebrate those those um, th those prayers, you know, could be the Eucharistic prayer or any kind of any kind of liturgy that we have. So it's not I I I I want people whenever people go to the church, I want you want people to focus on one thing, right? The priest leading them or the cantors leading the people. And you want undivided attention to the worship of God, right? So when you see it that way, like something going overlapping, like I have seen it so many times, like even in Ethiopia, when it's, NA is going over here, there's something going on up there. There's something going on outside of the church. There's something going on in the yard. There's like four or five things going on. I don't think that's good for people, right? You want people to have like a full experience of the traditions and the prayers and everything. So. So it, it is something that we have to we have to sit down, you know, like our church gets like so many, so many troubles, so many problems every day. And our bishops, like people who have like authority to, to make order in the church, have no time to actually do these things, do the actual job and like do read through like something like how the, you know, even next celebration, how is that going to be done in the church the proper way? How we how we supposed to worship God? So there's a lot of things that we have to read through. So I, I would say like I would be more aligned to whatever you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, you know, at the end of the day, who am I a sinner and a mere deacon? 
But if anyone ever has my ear, if you're listening, you know, my bishop, uh, Abu Nabar Nabas, his beatitude does listen. His his English is not the best, but he does try to listen to the program. So <laughs> if he's listening, and I'll tell him in person too, and if Abuna Dimitros is listening to us too, because you're on this program, we have at least two bishops here in Canada and in Southern California. So, you know, we, we almost got a party started there. Um, you know, one more and you can make us in it, but <laughs> that's another story. So if they ever listen to me, if I ever had if the, if I ever had their ear, I think the intelligent thing, I think God loves order. You use the word order. I think God loves order. And I think th that there's a beauty in our diversity and you mentioned Waldeba, you know, where my grandfather is buried and many ancestors before that. I also have some at, uh, at uh, St. Teklahaimano's resting place at Debra Libanos. What I understand of Waldeba is they have so chosen one thing. They have chosen simply not to do Akwaquam and so they just do the Eucharistic liturgy and the liturgy of ours. I would never want to impose that on the whole of Ethiopia because the monastic living is supposed to be different, you know. I think... Um, there are people in general skeptical of the pace of kabaro hitting. And if we see and we're honest with ourselves about the way in which the hitting of the Afro-Asiatic pedal drum has increased its pace over time, uh, we see the direction it's going. Some of the way God is being worshipped, I think you can very honestly categorize as orthodox, um, but uh you know charismatic or pentecostal almost to the point you know at the point you're spinning like a tornado and you've got the the kabro above your head i've seen s a few bishops like uh the bishop of gondar his beatitude uh, abun johannes i've seen him tell people to put the the drum down because he thought they they crossed the line and and i know people in the, the gondar city tradition they love hitting and they love the aquaquam tradition in fact it's the certification house of aquaquam but they don't want to go too crazy. Um, they tell people to calm down at certain points. And in different areas of Ethiopia, it, it, it's different. So I think diversity of practice should be respected. But the fact that we have all these different um, these different evolutions, like you said, we've been persecuted. We've had several existential threats to Christianity in Ethiopia with Judith in the 900s, with... Uh, the left-hander Ahmed in the 1500s with the Italians in the 19th century and the 20th century. And we could even say with um, the past regimes of the 50 years, uh, you know, because that first regime, the communist regime, was very antithetical. You know, the, the Marxism-Leninism, I don't know if there are any Marxist-Leninists in the audiences. Sometimes there are. But whatever you think of that ideology, one of the expressed things they say is that religion is the opiate of the masses. They're calling religion a drug. So it's it's very anti-religion. So we've had a lot of existential threats and persecution the way you said. But that being said, I think there should be order. So each parish should decide, you know, what type of a parish they are. You know, um, are they an instrumental parish or not? Um, do they do the full 24 hours? Do they do the four hours? Do they do two hours? There should be some flexibility and it should also be based, like you said, off of the scarcity or the presence of clergy who are capable of consistently doing that service. And I think, like you said, there's there's times of discontinuity and I think just times of nobody wanting to take the lead, nobody wanting to take that responsibility and accountability. So we have these systems, but occasionally we need some great men to arise and to bring some order. And so hopefully these conversations that we have are leading to that so that we can uh, get away from that and get towards some of the beauty of your writing. I have your book in front of me. I know you have it in front of uh, you as well. I would like for us to go back and forth and do at least the daily prayers. And we can talk a little bit about the daily prayers and then we'll start talking about the uh, the other contents of the book. Can you start us off with um, the I cross my face? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. I cross my face and all my soul by the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Believing in the Holy Trinity and entrusting myself, I deny you Satan in front of my mother, the Holy Church, who is my witness in heaven, wherever I am in. We thank you, O Lord, and we glorify you. We praise you, O Lord, and we rely on you. We beg you and we beseech you. We worship you and we serve your holy name. We worship you, O oh, you to whom all knees should bow and to whom all tongues serve. You are the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the King of kings. You are God to all flesh and all soul. And we call you as your holy son taught us saying, 
when you pray, you shall say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. By the greetings of the holy Archangel Gabriel, peace be upon you. O oh, my Lady Mary, you are virgin in thought and virgin in body. The mother of the Lord of hosts, peace be to you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Rejoice, who you who is joyous, O oh, full of grace, God is with you. Entreat and pray for our mercy to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, that he may forgive us our sins. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, who created the heavens and the earth and all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten but not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from the heavens and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. And he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate suffered and was buried and on the third day he rose from the dead according to the scriptures ascended to the heavens and sat at the right hand of his father and he is coming again in his glory to judge the living and the dead his kingdom shall have no end yes we believe in the holy spirit the lord the life giver who proceeds from the father who with the father and the son is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets and we believe in the one holy universal and apostolic church we confess one baptism for the remission of sins we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the coming age forever and ever amen holy 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 lord of hosts heaven and earth are full of your holiness of your glory we worship you O christ with your good father and the holy spirit for you have come and saved us I worship the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I worship the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I worship the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Three and one and one in three. Three in persons and united in the Godhead. I bow down to Our Lady Saint Mary the Virgin, the Mother of God. I bow down to the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was sanctified by his precious blood. The cross is our power, the cross is our strength, the cross is our redemption, the cross is the salvation of our souls. The Jews denied but we believe, and those who believe in the power of the cross are saved. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and glory to the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and glory to the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and glory to the Holy Spirit. Veneration to our Lady Saint Mary and the Mother of God. Veneration to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. May Christ remember us in his mercy. May he not put us to shame during his second coming. Amen. May he awaken us to the glorification of his name. Amen. May he make us steadfast in his worship. Amen. Our Lady St. Mary, help us forgive our sins and lift up our prayers before the throne of our Lord. Amen. Who gave us to eat this bread. His who mercy endures forever. Who gave us to drink this cup. His mercy endures forever. And who prepared our food and our clothing for us. His mercy endures forever. And he over looked all our sins his mercy endures forever and who gave his holy body and his precious blood his mercy endures forever who brought us to this hour let us give glory and thanks to god to the most high and also venerate the virgin mother of god and the precious cross of the lord may the name of the lord be thanked and glorified always at all times and every hour we say to you with prostration, peace be unto you, Mary, our mother. We beseech you to protect us from the hunting serpent. O Virgin, for the sake of your mother, Anna, and your father, Iyaikim, bless our congregation today. Prayer of Our Lady Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations shall call me blessed. For the Almighty has done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on, on them who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant, Israel, 
for he has remembered his co covenant of mercy that he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and will be unto the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Those were the daily prayers. Of course, there's a lot more in this book and we're going to discuss it, but I thought it'd be great just to have that portion of the daily prayers to show people how easy it is to just put a little bit of prayer in your life. And of course, you you start off with a little bit and the holier you get and the more you bless yourself in the fasting, you you increase your your prayer capacity. But but folks at home, it's it's that simple. Going back to um, the beginning there. Is there anything that you want to say about your translation thoughts and processes of the I cross my face portion? Yeah, um, actually, like I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, the first paragraph, uh, I cross my face and all of myself by the sign of the cross. Uh, there's one portion that has a typo in, in the gear tradition. So this is going to be another very controversial topic. I noticed that. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say like which part that is just I would, I would leave that part out. Okay. But um, so what happened was that when someone was copying a manuscript in the old days before printing press, uh, they made it they made a very, very error, like very common error that you find in the actual Bible. So like in different manuscripts, like you find this like very similar sounding words would be copied and the person who's copying, probably you have like someone reading and like five people making a copy, right? And one of them could hear some, some other word than uh, what was actually said. So that's, we believe that that's what happened. But the problem was that uh, when that translation <laughs> happened, this pseudo traditions, like, like we mentioned earlier, can uh, people kind of like, kind of, start using that and it is kind of forbidden to say oh that was actually a typo it's not it's not what it, it was saying but i'm glad this book makes the original connection and like reads through the pseudo tradition and goes back to the original tradition so you don't want to make another typo um when you're when you're publishing so that's why when you're republishing and redoing some some of the work that's already done this is the, one of the benefits that you get. You go back to the original tradition. And um, and also, uh, recently I heard, I, I have heard so many things about the first page of prayer. You have the I cross my face, and you have the Ethiopian Thanksgiving prayer, the Giz right Thanksgiving prayer. And we also have the Thanksgiving prayer that's commonly used in the Coptic right? Um, but this is one of the Giz right, and it's it's uh, written by, um, the Emperor Zariago. So I have heard different names also, but I have I have recently I won't name the bishop name, but recently a bishop from that area was uh, was was talking about the daily prayers, and he mentioned that I was actually written by uh, is uh, the Emperor Zariago. So you have kings writing <laughs> prayers, you have saints writing prayer. So. Um, that's that's very interesting. It's it's kind of like a pre, a pre log, like a, a pre prayer before our Lord's prayer. Absolutely, and that's because people in the Anglo tradition of which Canada and America are both squarely, although you have the Franco tradition as well in Canada. In the Anglo tradition, they originated really with the founding of the United States. This idea of separation in church and state. There's nothing like it in Ethiopia. And I always recommend people go read Church and State in Ethiopia by Taddesa Ta'amrat. He was actually my father's professor of history at Haile Selassie University before the communists take over. And it's funny, within a year or two, they both uh, made their way to Los Angeles. But uh, in any event, uh, I hope we get an answer from above. And uh, that, that itself is a intended pun for those who get it for that first prayer. And in the Thanksgiving prayer, we have something that I, I would like to discuss with you that I found to be an issue, and I pointed it out to people in his Beatitude, Abu Namal Kasidik's fantastic book. It's, it's such a fantastic book that when I criticize it, you have to hear me. We give that book to almost anyone of the past 10 years when they're deciding to be a catechumen. Like it's our it's like our book of catechesis at the Virgin Mary's in the South Central Los Angeles. Um, 
but but to your point, you know, in in Spanish, because you know I'm a Spanish speaker in LA. There's a famous story, I forget which one, but of a king in Spain who looked at the word or the letter C and pronounced it with a TH. So you have a word like bicycle, which is bicicleta in Spanish, and he would pronounce it bicicleta. Uh, you have a word like a manzana, which is uh, an apple, and uh, now you have the Z, but it has a similar sound, a manzana with a TH. And because of his uh, verbal typo, for centuries it became an accent. So the famous European location for party uh, destinations is Ibiza, and the people there call it Ibiza. So we have to be careful not to repeat centuries, even if it's centuries old typos. And I appreciate that. But going on to the Thanksgiving, there was this word in Abuna Merkis Edik's um, book on the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which included the daily prayers, that it's this translation of the word Sigdet, which we also find in the word Masgid, or Masjid, which is used by the Beta Israel, the Ethiopian Jews, as well as the Muslim world in the Arabic language. And that word is related to our word, Sagada, which means to... Um, well, I'll, le I'll let you define it. Can you talk about it? Because you defined it here as worship, and I see later on, because I know the prayers, that you, you defined it contextually and dynamically in different ways. But I understand the sort of base meaning to be prostration or bowing down. And I see you use the word worship. The issue I'll say with Abu Namedika's edict's version is the word worship is used in, in every instance. And that's great for consistency, but I think it, it brings some alarming results when translated into English. So if you can talk about the word sagada or sigdet and how you, you translated it here and elsewhere. Um, yeah, I, I would say like that. <laughs> That's that's one of the unique ways of Giz Giz words Giz words work, right? So, um, English is much more spe specific than Giz, right? So you have like many words to describe a lot of things, but in Giz you, you could have like one word, but depending on the context, it, it could mean like completely different things, right? So this is this is one of uh, one of the thing one of the instances that we have, right? You have Sigdet as when it used with conducted with God, the Lord, or like God or Lord Xavier or Geta Xavier XD or Lord or God. Um, it could mean worship. So it, it means worship. But we use the same word to 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 say venerate in English or like bow down to someone. Or I I would argue my first um choice of word was like Matania. The Greek word matania. I believe that's the, the root word is a Greek. And that word, to use that word for the saints and for Saint Mary, for the angel, for the cross, instead of the veneration word. But what what was the problem with that is that a lot of people who are exposed to this book are gonna be like young people mm -hmm. who are not familiar with a lot of Greek words, right? Yeah. So it could be difficult for them. Like even for the for the Orthodox Greek. I would prefer to use uh, "We believe in one God, uh, the the Lord Jesus Christ, the Pantocrator." Like that's interesting. More like the like the that's the transliterated from the Coptic and the Greek, which is their version of saying "Almighty," right? Almighty. Oh yeah. Exactly. And our our version, by the way, when I've translated in the past, I try to gizify it. Ahaziakulu is it's not directly Almighty. It's like He who holds or grasps all in His hand. Yeah, like a different way exactly. of thinking about the same the same topic. Yeah, right. Like we we kind of like imagine God being everything is on His hand. Yeah, like there are like visually descriptive words like in Gis, which are like beautiful to preserve in English, but they could become wordy for people mm -hmm. to pray. We can't expect people to have like very wordy words uh, to use them like like routinely like in in their prayers. So that's why like we kind of have to choose this kind of wording. But yeah, so but for for Sigdet, it could cause some theological issues, right? When you use yeah. it uh, consistently as a worship for different people, not just God, but saints and the cross and a lot of it. So, yeah, my Greek um, is, by the way, very weak, but um, yeah. I have come across in Father Laurent Creek. We mentioned the Orthodox Study Bible from Thomas Nelson earlier. Father Laurent Creek, who I thought about, but I didn't, I didn't mention, he has the Greek Orthodox Bible, which is directly from them, no Protestant influence at all, just the Greeks. And um, 
he has just the New Testament. He had been working on it with a lot of other people, but the Old Testament, they had a few books translated. They never finished it. So they have a New Testament. I believe the app is still out there. It's called Eastern Orthodox Bible or Greek Orthodox Bible. And I myself, it's one of my many projects I never finished, but uh, I had told him at one point I would do the audio version. And I had gotten through the uh, most of the Gospels, but I, I fell off myself. So maybe it's a reminder to get to back to it. And from there, he uses the word proskuneo. And I think the proskuneo um, has the similar connotation of prostration or bowing down that then other people say um, admiration, worship, veneration. There's so many different dynamic ways. But yeah, you, you, you find it off the context. Even the same word has multiple meanings. Yeah, that, that's the problem you have is in with a lot of translators who are like, you know, I would say like Western people mostly who know Giz, uh, just, I mean, from from academic point of view, uh, not knowing like the tradition and like the background of like each word, each word has like cultural meaning behind it. Each word is like defined by context, right? And so you have like this kind of trans translation that you see from from those people. So I try to avoid that and like try to find like the context and like do a little bit of like research based approach. So how many times this word has been mentioned in the Old Testament, in New Testament, and how has it been used in our liturgical usage, right? So, and that way you can kind of find, feel like where that context lies. So you can kind of use it, like you can kind of, it, it makes it easier for you to, to choose what what words to choose in English? That's right. And um, how about your work with the Lord's Prayer and the Marian Prayer? I'll say from what I can tell, you used the standard kind of KJV language, which people are accustomed to. One of the things I like about that for the Lord's Prayer is there seem to be like 30 different versions of the Lord's Prayer. And even Pope Francis had some comments on the Lord's Prayer a few years ago. It seems like the things people, David Bentley Hart, the uh, Orthodox Christian scholar who uh, has a little bit of too much that all should be saved, in, in my opinion, uh, which I find to be just a heresy spread, but I like his translation of the New Testament. He just came out with a version two of his translation, and I know he's very keen on certain words like debt and debtors versus trespass and uh, trespassing, but it, it, you seem to do the standard KJV uh, language, which I think most people have have memorized in English, so it allows you to at least be saying the same words. And the Marian one, I was just having a conversation with. I serve a parish in DC online called Bazirwa Tealich Maram, and we're having a a conversation with their Sunday school teachers, where we've gotten all their students to memorize the Lord's Prayer and Mary's Prayer in Giz, which is fantastic. But now they don't know it in Amharic, and then now we're also trying to get them to learn it in Amharic and in English. But in English, there's like five different versions that, that I have seen. So I wonder your process on finding the Lord's Prayer and then what you used for Marian prayer. I don't know if you participate in any English um, liturgies in the Toronto area. Uh, we don't have a lot of English liturgies, but um, I would say for the Lord's Prayer, you, you exactly nailed it. That, that's why we used uh, with thine is uh, the, the kingdom and the power. Like people are like already using that, so no need to change that. So that that I, I believe that's the only like King James uh, English that we have in this book, and the other is like we don't use any archaic for itself. Um, uh, you know, those 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 type of words. Um, but uh, I would say, um, I would say for the Miriam prayer, uh, what. What I try to do is that to get as close as possible to the Giz mm -hmm. and I have seen like so many very different versions, but even the Amharic version has like, I have an issue with it, with it. I would just leave it at that, right? And so avoid any bias, any previous translations and just look at the, give, give it a, like a fresh look for the Giz version. Yeah. And, and then, um, and then like try to make it as close as possible. That's 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 what has been done. You got me Amharic. curious now about the Amharic, about the Mary version, because the only big difference that I see is some people say Lulu Xavier and some people just say Xavier. So most high God versus God. And then some people just say forgiveness. I see you went with the mercy and forgiveness, which is something that I I, I see, which is just classic uh, synonymic parallelism, uh, which yeah. I believe we picked up from the Hebrew Bible and but we could have had innately in Giz as well. 
where we say the same thing in, in different ways, you know, Oh Lord, uh, bless your people, save your inheritance. Like it's the same thing being said in different ways. Um, but yeah, that that's very interesting. And the creed, the Nicene Constantinopolitan creed, or what we call Salota Haibadot, the prayer of religion or the prayer of faith. I think mostly that one seems to be a standard version too, from what I see in your, um, in your prayer. Um, I'll start off with a silly question and then I'll go to a more serious uh, scholarly question. The, uh, the Catholic lowercase c with universal. I, I love that you gave us both options so that people who understand that we're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church can say the word Catholic knowing it's about Catholicity, whereas other people, if they just want to skip it and go to universal, they go to that. Any, any thoughts on that Catholic universal uh, dynamic? Yeah, that's that's also another thing because it, the book is targeted for youth, and you have like a little bit of theological knowledge. So you you just gotta give them an option that you don't want them to think that this is this is not about Roman Catholic Church. It's just universality. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, and the more serious scholarly question, and we can push it aside if not, because it might need a, a journal length uh, entry, which I had thought about before, but I just never pursued. Was um, there's this interesting line that we find in the in the English, and I see it in a lot of places, of one essence with the Father. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the, it's the one phrase in the original Greek that was not a phrase originally found in Scripture. So it's something that the Fathers kind of uh, came up with. If I'm not mistaken, it's the homoousia. And the is that I have seen and the Amharic I have seen don't seem to be quite that. I think something like that would be like, uh, or something, uh, but what I see is right, and then the Amharic, I'm wondering if it, because you're consulting the the is so often, um, what do you think of words like the is uh, and the um, the Amharic, especially the Amharic, I think is is even a little different, the because it doesn't seem to be quite the same thing there. Um. I would say uh, the the general idea of those words. I, I think I would say like they need they need a lot of work. They need a lot of analysis. How those words have been used, especially like in the Book of Faith, Amarat Avo, like how different you know patristic fathers have have been using them, and how our translation has been responding to that word. Right. Whenever they see it, how are they capturing it in Gids? So. I would say more of like comparative analysis for that word is needed to give like very comprehensive answer. Like I could come up with like a bunch of lists and from pre nicene and fathers, Nicene and fathers, and how are they how 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 they they were using it using that word and making a, a Greek equivalent for that word would be like would be like great to do honestly. But uh, the general idea is that. To give Christ, who is who is who is equal to the Father, that that's pretty much the general idea of that word. Uh, you have in case both in Amharic, but Amharic could be tricky because there are different versions of Amharic, and one so from Shoah, one so from Ansof, sorry, and so from Shoah. People from Shoah or you know Gondor could come up with like a better word, or could come up with a different word, but the general idea is that. You have God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who are like equal in their God in their in their Godhead. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. I agree with you. I also think it's important to see how we phrased those things and how we put them in our own language. I always uh, remind people of the Wuchale Treaty between Emperor Minilik and the monarchical Italians before the fascist Italians. And there's this famous, I think the word is yikr, that is in their, in their uh, treaty, and both sides interpreted it differently. And I think it's very important that we interpret things on our own terms. And in general, you know, people who, who know my programs know I, I tend to favor the Semitic side of Christianity more than the Greco side because of, a, of an extreme fear I have of entering into Neoplatonism and the consequences thereof. So in general, uh, while I appreciate the Greek fathers, I like the Gittas and the Syriac fathers a little more. And um, 
I, I think there's a stylistic difference from the early church, from the school of Antioch and the school of Alexandria. Ultimately, both schools are in the church, and that's my belief. But just kind of, um, I think our hierarchy is more Alexandrian, but I think our school of biblical interpretation has a greater school of Antioch flavor. And I don't think it's an accident. The fact that the school of Antioch, you had a few people like John Chrysostom writing in Greek, but majority you have these these Syriac writers in the West Syriac and the East Syriac tradition, even when you examine like the beautiful plays that we have with Feyat Yaman or the criminal or the brigand on the right hand that's said on Good Friday or Siklet, as well as the, uh, the plays on the devil, you see these traditions, again, not in the Greek text, but you find them in Syriac. And so I think there, there's these certain ways in which we phrase the equality um, that was kind of appropriate and, and use the word context a lot, contextual for our situation that I that I found fascinating. But like you said, it 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 deserves a a much uh, greater uh, strategy. But did you have anything more to say on that? Otherwise, I have uh, more, of course, to ask you about. No, that's uh, that's great. I would say one thing is that like uh, to better know our church, it's not to go for you know like Eastern Orthodox or like the Greek Orthodox or like even Coptic. Uh, Orthodox, like to go for the Syrian church, there is a very rooted understanding and deep rooted, like um, like cross theologizing between the Syrian church and Ethiopian church. Not just theology, but also like our hymns, a lot of things, and a lot of things cross over, and that goes way back to like the nine saints. You know, had greatly influenced Hengai, and it just cascading effect after that. So uh, understanding and seeing it through the CIA church is much better option than like the, I mean, I would prefer people see our church through our church, but if you had to see it outside of our church, seeing it the C from the CIA church is a much better approach than the other way. I fully agree. I fully agree with that. And you have the holy, holy, holy prayer, which is obviously that line from Isaiah 6 and then added to it about the prostration or worship of of Christ and um, his good and heavenly father and the Holy Spirit. This prayer, I always know it because I do the associate deacon part way more than the doer of good or the gabari sannai, the first deacon. And so I'm always ready because as soon as uh, we say, you have come and saved us, I have to say, tan si'ulas alot or arise for prayer. Um, but just any any thoughts about how this is in our daily prayers and the liturgy or any thoughts on this short prayer? Uh, you find this prayer in the Coptic rite as well, and um, it, it kind of like in our tradition. Again, this needs like a lot of research, but in our tradition, when you have a prayer, like a major prayer coming up, there's gonna be a preamble to it, right? It's kind of like you know, uh, front runner prayer, I would say, right? Kind of like preparing you to pray more to the other prayer, so. It comes right before you have like I worship the Father prayer, like the three times, and like that's what that's how like it got into that uh, that position. But you find it in the Udasimaya, you find it in the liturgy, you also find it in the Coptic rite. So it's not surprising that you see it in the daily prayer. Yes, and um that's a great way to think of it it reminds me of the exhibit mean it's like hey dog you need a prayer before your prayer so that when you do prayer you can do prayer <laughs> it's like amazing which is uh if you ever want more prayers you know obviously Diakontadios is helping you guys and uh, we're going to plug it again at the end um the i worship the father prayer we kind of spoke of this already but the, the word the sagada or sigdet is is here right but you you use a different context i know the academics they use this phrase that i i, I don't like i saw it first in ephraim isaac you know, before he got involved in some of the recent politics um but they call it the cult of mary and the cult of the cross when they discuss it but it's like the same word is used for the holy trinity but also mary and the cross but you're talking about earlier about it's the context that that makes that word used differently. And I believe in this context you used, uh, rather than veneration about bowing down or, or, or prostration and then worship for the Trinity. And any, any thoughts there about the, the kind of the physical act of prostration versus just saying veneration? Like, I don't know, is, is vener can you venerate while just standing or is prostration and bowing down like one of the sort of necessary physical components of the mental spiritual veneration? Um, yeah, so 
I guess bowing down and veneration, more so bowing down, have like also like the cultural context in our culture. Like you have this, the ancient civilization, I would say like the Middle Eastern, like the ancient East, and like you have our culture, like more so bowing down and going down under the feet of someone is is shown as more of like a respect. Like it's shown like as a humility, right? I am I'm showing my humility before you. So you have that aspect of it. So you have that bowing down. So it's more of cultural. And then that cultural, like we show it in different degrees. There's like a huge spectrum of it, right? One is the ultimate one is like for God, like that bowing down. And more than veneration, we give worship. By bowing down, we show worship there. We show complete, absolutely like humility. But it goes down and like you have like St. Mary, you have the cross, you have the angels. And by bowing, by bowing down, we show humility. We venerate them that way as well. So like it's it's kind of like a spectrum of things that we show. And if if someone someone who knows gifts, someone who understands gifts, if you're saying this prayer for someone who's living in the 900, who's like speaking gifts every single day, but it has like it gives them they know the context. There's no confusion. And each time they do it for Mary, saying it for God, saying it for the angel, for the cross, it's gonna have like a different meanings for them. Right, they're showing a spectrum of respect for the God and the whole His whole council. That's right. I I definitely agree with you. The way um, I studied cross cultural dispute resolution and cross cultural navigation in law school, and the way they describe it is they call it high context societies versus low context societies. In the United States, sorry for my American example, we have the bi coastal elites of which I am one. In the West Coast, we have Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle. In the East Coast, we have DC, Boston, and New York. And those are extremely like extreme examples of low context societies where you need to spell everything out. You don't have the, the, the contextual knowledge that you're describing, but you have a little bit more nuance and a little bit more context when you go to the Midwest. You know, I've lived in North Dakota and traveled to Minnesota a lot. You see it there. I've been to Texas and to Georgia. You see it a lot there. But the extreme example is, like you said, 9th century Ethiopia or even 20th and 21st century Ethiopia, especially if you go outside of uh, Addis Ababa and go to more rural areas, you get this high context where, you know, Besides the episode of, uh, we mentioned Emperor Zerayak, of uh, the other side of the coin there, the Stephanites, besides that episode, everyone kind of usually has the same understanding. And in my parents' own life, um, Emperor Haile Selassie visited their schools when they were in grade school, and they went to two different British schools in Addis Ababa, and they told me that when that would happen, and I've seen you know black and white video footage of this, like people would prostrate before the emperor. People uh, in biblical times and earlier in the Near East, as you said, bowed before judges, like <laughs> secular judges as well. Um, so yeah, definitely context is the the mode there. And the next thing we have, which is similar, is a similar, I think, discussion, is we have the sibhat or the glory prayer. And in here, again, you have a sibhat or glory for the Holy Trinity. And then we have the the veneration being given to the Mary and the cross, but going back to your context, is it just a copy paste of the same argument here? Or what do you have to say about the glory prayer and how it's used in the daily prayers, but also after we eat food? Um, yeah, so it is kind of like a very similar to the previous argument, uh, but the only thing different is that glory implies worship. So when you give glory to something, you are implying you're actually worshiping them too. So that's why you don't see that word using for St. Mary and the cross and, you know, the whole swaths of saints and everyone, right? Um, and also, this is this is one of unique opportunity for, for the scholars to study how this came about to be like our post-meal prayer. And in other traditions, like you have seen people pray like different prayers from our father, like eating after, like praying our father after a meal. Or uh, I have seen in the Coptic chair, for example, they have different prayer for after food. And it, it is it is interesting how it kind of like ended up being. Um, and we have also like very strong tradition, right? We don't even have like sub tradition for this. Everywhere you go throughout Ethiopia, everyone prays this prayer after a meal, any church. But we don't even have like sub tradition to compare it to. So this is one of the interesting things to find out. It would be interesting to find out. 
Yeah, and I and I kind of put you on the spot and did it a little differently, and we figured it out because you and I both have that high context with each other. Because even though we've never met each other in real life, we've never served together because of the universality of the tradition. You and I both know it, and so typically when you'd read the daily prayers, you're kind of not doing it because you're by yourself. But if you do it with other people, there are parts where you say Amen, and there are parts where you say Ismalalim Mihratu or His mercy endures forever, or the mercy of the Lord endures forever. I've seen other translations, uh, His mercy is everlasting, or His loving kindness is forever. Um, what, what do you make of the Amens versus the Ismalalim uh, Mihratu? And then, and then there's a part where I know you kind of paused too, but I didn't want the endice to by, so the mics don't mess up. There's also a part where everybody starts saying the end of the prayer together. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, so we start saying uh, "Amen." Like so, "Amen" is like it, it is translated in. I mean, it's universal <laughs> language where everyone, every like, yeah, sentence, but unwritten in this prayer. Yeah, unwritten in this prayer because of that strong tradition. Like everyone knows it. You're expected to do that. Like it, we didn't plan this before. Like you're gonna say "Amen" when we <laughs> do that prayer, but you, you just knew when said what to say like when i when i was pausing for that um and you have i mean is i mean is like translated as uh let it be or like let it be done to me that's like exact translation that you find in the various dictionaries Alek Ayali, Alek, uh, no, Alek Akidano, sorry for example he translated as like let it be or let it be done to me so you kind of have the 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 not question statements you have May Christ remember us in his mercy. Yeah, let it be done to me. Like, let it be done to us or let it be let it be it. And then he goes on to say what has been given to us, right? Like the kind of the second half, it was more um, help us uh, who gave us to eat his bread and who gave us to eat the drink, to drink from the from this cup, right? So you have, you have this, the loving kindness and the mercy of God right so the mercy of god in the love of god and if you read for example saint isaac the syrian uh he goes on to say that everything is ordered everything is created like not just us like every creation you see in the world is created because of the mercy of god because of his loving kindness we kind of have like a western mindset when we think about mercy as is you doing something bad and god forgiving you but it's it's the other way around Mercy always exists. Mercy is like love. Like mercy is what gives order to everything, right? So you have that idea of mercy and loving kindness of God way, way before like everything is created. And everything exists because of his mercy, because of his loving kindness, continues to exist. And now in this modern age, like the people who wrote this prayer lived in this modern age, in this post-Messianic age that we have Christ with us. Right, we have Christ with us. He is giving us His bread. He gave us more because of His mercy and His loving kindness. We have like additional mercy. What has been in addition to what has been given to us. So we respond to that, like we respond to acknowledging and in shock of the mercy of God. Right, He gave us so much before, and now He gave us even more. Right, so it, it is kind of like a shocking response to the loving kindness of God, his patience, his mercy. And you kind of respond to that. And then the final part is that let us give, let us give glory and thanks to God the most high. So this is also common in our uh, Eucharistic prayer or non-Eucharistic prayer. For example, in Sahatan, you have like so many parts that are said by one side, the other side, one side, the other side. And sometimes they come together and say the same thing. Um, and and, and uh, very synchronized fashion right this is this is one of the prayers that we have you can see like the tradition of prayer and you can see how some things are said not just by by one people and responding but we all ask for the same thing we all ask give worship and glory to him so it kind of has like that that rhythm of prayer so that's that's one of the reasons that you see in the small prayer yeah, it's it's wonderful the the mustazazel or the colon and response of the clergy, let let alone um, including the faithful and others. The next prayer is the salam aleki, 
which has, I've heard so many different versions sung, even during Abis Om, the great fast now, when we're standing the, the Mazmur or the spiritual song of St. Yared, we got a new Marigeta at our church. I, I heard like a new version of Salam Aleki or this peace be unto you prayer. I've heard the one that's usually said with Uddasi um, Mariam, which we'll get to the praise of Mary, which I believe is uh, usually uh, this one. And then there's the one that's that's used in the liturgy that's a part of Malika Urban as well which is right before the communion is served to the uh, people. I found a version of this prayer that I believe is from the 200s in a, in a manuscript that people have shared online in Copts, uh, in the Coptic language. And so I believe it, it's actually like one of the earliest evidences of the church, of the intercession of the saints. And so I always loved it for that reason. Um, and recently I had a, a cousin who went to Gondar and recorded one of her old uncles telling like an oral history. And uh, he used the word Zendo in Amharic. She didn't know what it was. To explain what Zendo was, he said Arwe. And I'm not sure if she knew what Arwe was. But I was listening to this recording and I was like, oh, that's a, very amazing. Because as we know in Giz, we have Arwe Midr, which is literally the beast of the earth. But it's dynamically understood to be talking about a snake who's kind of doomed and cursed to uh you know frolic on the, on the earth in that in that way um so you've translated the amarwena awi as the hunting serpent but you also have given the option of beast and i have to say i've never seen hunting serpent for this before i had always compared it to the scroll of ezekiel um where he says to watch out for predatory animals. And so on one layer, I've seen this prayer as literally as you travel, there are predatory beasts or predatory animals that you want Mary to protect you from through her prayers. But also in Ezekiel, those predatory animals in the context of the good shepherd uh, refers to false teachers. So you also want Mary's prayer to protect you from false teachers. I've always understood it that way. I, don't, I wonder how you understand this and what you can tell us about the hunting serpent versus the beast. Yeah, so um, one of the things is that uh, this is also one of the very ancient prayers. Uh, we have a tradition, one tradition saying that this is this comes from St. Yared. Um, that, so you can say five or six century St. Yared. And this, uh, the usage of the word our way um, is that by itself, it can suggest, like you said, like the serpent from Genesis story from Adam and Eve, right? And, but the story doesn't end there, right? There's like the dynamic aspect of that, right? So we always think back and say, oh, that's just something that happened um, in the garden of Eve between those two people and I'm out. <laughs> It's not. It's not gonna fix me, but but the gears wording is like um, am I way now we like that like that that serpent or that beast is like it's still active, right? <laughs> that active nature of it is is recorded throughout the Bible. You have you mentioned Ezekiel. You also uh, you also have like a Revelation, Saint John describing the beast in that way, and uh, and uh, the the beast that's gonna be. You know, spiritually and people attacking people. So those two words are gonna are, are signifying this this active nature of it, right? This active nature that that's gonna be going on forever. So like we all gonna we're gonna battling it, right? So that's why that that word usage is is used for that. So in Giz, you only have our way, and you only get like the the, the active nature of it. The other is that just context, but you cannot find it if you just translate it as serpent. But to to show people that this is not just talking about the past. This is just this is also talking about the present and the future. You have to add this beast as an option, and you have to, you also have like the hunting. It's not just something that's tied down, but it's also active. Yeah, right? I see that in the Amharic. In the Amharic, I've saw I've seen the um. <clears throat> the homonym uh, for, I remember this because I always had issue with what's called gemination in Amharic being the Faranj that I am. So matbak namalalat in Amharic, the adain versus the adain. And the adain aure 
is the hunting beast. I've seen that in Amharic translations before, but I've never seen the whatever the equivalent of Ad-Daing is in Ge'ez. I've, I've never seen. Yeah, the, the Ge'ez is like it's so hidden. Like, so Amharic doesn't have this feature. Like, rarely have it, rarely has like some feature that's the context is like the, the other meaning is like hidden within it, right? But mostly it's it's a very self-explanatory. But the Ge'ez is like more complicated. So, so in translations, like one word could become a sentence or a paragraph, or it could, it could become like two words. Like this example, you have like another option, and you have the 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 verb before it. Fantastic. And the last one of the daily prayers before we move on to the uh, rest of the book is what's called usually in the Western tradition the Magnificat, or "My soul magnifies the Lord." In the Greek tradition, we have. Um, Abba Thomas Finley, who is a white American priest convert in our church, who he's sung this before our congregation in the Greek style before. Um, but there's a, it's a wonderful prayer. It's my favorite prayer, and it's from the uh, the Gospel of Luke. We actually have it written in Amharic on the bench outside of our parish because we have a, a Virgin Mary parish. So yeah, what what do you uh, what did you kind of consult for uh, this Marian prayer or the Magnificat? Yeah, so any of the the biblical references that you see in this book are taken from New King James Version, unless there's like some wild, wild um, variation in some wording, like we didn't change it, like nothing is changed. So you have the idea is that people are more used to New King James Version. So that's more or less that. So any biblical reference you see is like New King James Version. But in the future, when the full book comes out, like the, the whole Sabbath comes out, the sorry, Book of Hours comes out, um, uh, there's, there's a plan to revisit New King James Version, even the Orthodox Study Bible, and to get as close as possible to the Giz context, consulting commentary, consulting any oral tradition that we can access, and also consulting any other Greek tradition that our tradition lacks. So there is that going on for that. But for this, it's a uh, very humble, you know, you can just version everything. No, yeah. I, I am a big believer in not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And this is a good book, which is why we're going to spend so much time today plugging it and really getting in depth so people could understand. Uh, to to your point, the only the only thing I would, I guess, um, you know, use the good is to push back on the NKJV here is, if I'm not mistaken, the word... Amet, which I always point out to people, uh, Amet, for uh, my Tigrinya-speaking friends who are better at preserving that part of Giz with the Ain or the Ainu A, uh, Hebrew and Amharic and Syriac and Aramaic speakers will also be aware of this. But Amet, spelled with the Aleph or the Alpha, means, uh, <laughs> means you are a handmaiden or a female slave, or a female bondservant. And the Amat, with the Ainu'a, is the 12 months, the year that we know. And so if I'm not mistaken, it's the Aleph uh, Amat, and the G is here. And so here we have lowly servant in your translation. And so potentially, if you consult the G is for the larger book of hours, or book of the liturgy of hours that you're going to do, that would be something like... I don't know, does it matter? I mean, it's really stylistic, but it, it, does it matter to specify, like I've seen some versions that say handmaiden or female slave or female bond servant or something like that. Yeah, if you, wa if you want to be like exactly like this, you would, just, you would phrase it as female servant or, yeah, but I, I guess the English kind of implies because it's St. Mary, she is yeah, female. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no yeah, yeah. Servant. Yeah, we have no questions about the gender of our Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. Yes, um, but but if you want to be very close to uh, to Giz, you would say female servant. But I also have a problem with cross crossing like different traditions, right? It makes sense in Giz to do that, but why am I bringing the Giz way of phrasing things to English? Like you know, crossing like different like grammar styles. So I, I kind of I, I struggle with that a lot. So I in the future it, maybe it's it's very tough. I'll tell you, um, 
<laughs> I've butted heads with people about it before because I tend to be on the literal or word for word side. And, and from how I hear you, you're on the dynamic or thought to thought side. And generally that's like the big difference, although not, I mean, not really, but maybe NKJV versus NIV, you know, NIV is kind of a more, I would say on the thought for thought version, but you know, um, one of the examples, like the craziest word is exabhit, right? And uh, been talking with a, a friend of mine who's in a patristic brotherhood with me and he's working in his scholarship trying to really like look at all the manuscripts and the word exabhit. People kind of typically just say, yeah, exabhit is God. And you're like, well, hold on. It begins with this word exe, which means Lord. So then exabhir becomes God. Well, when you break it down super literally, and I've done it in a few translations, like we'll get to it, you would like just just to show people. I I put Bakanda for in parentheses of the nation, which is Behir, a word that's been abused of the politics of the last 30 years, but it means a nation, not a small tribe, but the, the nation. And so Exabhir is literally the Lord of the nation, but sometimes it's used for the place of just God, and sometimes it's used just for the divine name Yahweh or you know Petrograph. And uh, so sometimes it could just be Lord. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it's very fascinating the, that that debate that you're talking about. And I've I've been in your shoes, I think, more than a, <laughs> a lot of other people. But it's a good thing to begin thinking about as we move on from there. What can you tell us of? I noticed you used the word theotokia, and I believe there's a book, I don't know if it's come out yet or on the way, comparing the Coptic theotokia to the Ge'ez rites, Wudasi Mariam, or the Marian praise, or the praise of Mary. So what can you tell us about the theotokia slash Marian praise? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that book. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Tassis Mavrat, with Father Mavrat, in this, uh, in this book. Um, he he did a, gave a review for that book, I believe, and uh, he was saying to me that what that that person found out about our Theotokia, our Dasimarium, is that our Dasimarium version is like the oldest version in the you know in the sister of the Syrians, Coptic, and us. So our Dasimarium version is like the oldest. So the way it's, it's structured is also like very different from the uh, from the Coptic one and. Um, I haven't seen the Syrian one, but I believe that person has seen has seen one. And so, um, the the word we use Theotokia is so, like I mentioned earlier, I usually use a research ap approach instead of I I don't. I, it's hard for me to come up with something um, and make it a tradition, but it's easier. For, it would be easier for me to pick up some Orthodox tradition in general. So I see our church, even though we're so, so late with this English game, um, I see like every Orthodox people are like struggling in this, like how to serve the Western population in English. It's it's all a struggle. Even the people who came here uh, like 100 years ago, right? And I have taken this word from the, the most the Byzantine tradition. So. Anything that goes with prayer of Mary, not exactly Dathi Mariam, but praises to Mary are named, it, 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 they usually refer to it as Theotokia. So that word is taken from them. And the Coptics also use it as the Coptic Orthodox, uh, their Dathi Mariam, which is almost identically as us, but it has like different variations. They usually use it also Theotokia. So that's why. I, I I chose to go with Theotokia. Um, one thing that this book does uh, very uniquely in terms of any copies that are published and even at home in Ethiopia is that it uses a little bit of commentary uh, on the start of each day of the Theotokia, right? So you have, every day has a theme, right? So for this day, and the commentary like that we have like a whole conversation going on between St. Mary and St. Ephraim, who's believed to be uh, to, to write this book, to, to write the Theotokia. The whole conversation, she comes home and she finds him sleeping and he asks her to, ble to bless him. He asks her, she asks him to write a hymn for her, right? And then uh, finally, it, there's there's interaction between them. He's very humble. He doesn't he doesn't want to do that, and she finally uh, 
he, he says to her, how can I praise you? The heavenly and earthly host of her, I just cannot praise you. How can I praise you? Then she said to him, praise me as the Holy Spirit revealed to you. Whatever is given to you by the Holy Spirit, just say it. And then he asked her uh, for her blessing and she blessed him. So in every day she comes and they they do like they have like this conversation with him. And on this day, on Monday, Ten Ephraim start her praise on the second day of creation. This is this, I believe, because this is a commentary, you have the Ethiopian style of observing Sabbath, which is the 48 hour. So it says the second day of creation. And but the first day for praise. So it uses the whole like Judeo, I would say Judeo is way of uh, celebrating the, the Sabbath. And then he praises her for the salvation of Adam since she brought Adam with her. And St. Mary also brings a saint to him. So on one day she comes with the prophets, the other day she comes with the, the apostles. And it kind of shows you how the the place of St. Mary and the whole council of God and the whole, and the whole, uh, the, the saints, the righteous people, the angels and everyone, the place of her, like people, the other saints come with her so that, like she can be praised by Saint Ephraim. Um, yeah, so this book kind of adds this commentary. Like we can we can say a lot of things about the commentary, which is it, its own thing, but it kind of gives like a little bit of a taste for for especially for English speaker who have never heard of the commentary. No, yeah, it's very good. And I myself would like to know all the connections with the Coptic and Syriac versions. I think I had heard from someone at one point that the Coptic one is the same, except it just doesn't ask for Mary's intercession in between each stanza. But I don't know exactly what those connections are. So I would I would look forward to more study on that. And like you said, the commentary tradition is is very Ethiopian in, in origin. So we can be proud of, of that contribution. Even the way you say that we have the oldest manuscripts, like it brings out a sense of pride in me because if you know our church and, and all of Christendom, you know that like, I would say we didn't necessarily invent a lot of things like we do have things we invented but in terms of like commentary and prayers like a lot of it we received from el elsewhere but we we're extremely open-minded in our sorts like you, you mentioned saint isaac the syrian somebody from a tradition that only accepts the two councils and lives centuries after all those decisions and, and we have him as one third of the book of monks which by the way Cassis Mabratu has done work and shown that actually three for three the entire book of monks all three of them are from the, the assyrian church of the east Make of that what you will. If you're uh, not a filthy ecumenist, you know <laughs> what do you do about that? Because that is the that is the tradition. That is the traditions our fathers gave us, whether people like that or not. Um, but I I would be very fascinated to see the way in which these things are connected. Because though we don't invent everything, I think one thing that we are incredible at doing in Ethiopia is preserving and saving those things that we we did have. So it's very possible that that we got a huge chunk of this from Egypt or Syria at one point. But as they lost it all, we saved it. You know, I saw something on YouTube uh, maybe a few months ago. It was. Um, one of the the anaphoras or liturgies eucharistic liturgies we had the copts had recognized it was one of their old ones which they had lost and then they retranslated from the giz in arabic and then they actually performed that liturgy in egypt and one of my egyptian friends told me that it's like banned now uh, by some synodal decision for 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 whatever reason but like they had access to their own old liturgy because of how well we preserve and save things then the next thing that i see you you have there is something that i've worked on in a translation as well a very fascinating text the the ua disawa uh, malaikt or the angels praise mary what can you say of your your work with that and i see you have a a special icon there of what seemed to be cherubim as well for that yeah it is uh that's one of the icons from you find from uh gunder never behind the last day church um so the the church of like full of like cherubims like just eyes after eyes like the whole scene and so this prayer is also ascribed to saint abadiogis so the, the 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 first half is after a little bit of introduction the first half is like almost exactly as how it is sold by saint luke and the gospel so it's just like copy paste of the gospel and but there is there's like back and forth of saying something about St. Mary 
you have Mary say, uh, for example, the angel say to her, and you say, peace be unto you. Like the other side would say, peace be unto you. And Gabriel said, peace be unto you. That kind of back and forth, which is, um, which is uh, done by, uh, uh, you have Abba George. And this is part of his, uh, his, his book of hours. Um, and this also one of the traditions that we have, I don't know if it's unique to us, but there is a way of getting text from the Bible, just like a bee, like a really good bee, right? Like, I don't know where it could be, but those are the ones like that get like the, all, all the goodies for the flowers. You have, um, you have our saints, our scholars, like taking something from the Bible and entirely modifying it. Like they take some chunk to it and they, they do like a preamble prayer. And then like there's a post prayer for that. And then like and as a whole, it makes so much sense, right? That like you reading the Bible, probably if you don't have the context, you're better off reading their version of those hymns that they create, right? And it's a very beautiful tradition that St. Yari has it. Um, and Midrash is like full of that. You have the song. Midrash and basically is the Psalms with some commentary. <laughs> some commentary, exactly. Like each, like there's, there's lines that he inserts. And it, it kind of like makes more sense for you. Like there's a lot of commentary to it. Like it gives, it gives uh, another, another light that you haven't seen by just reading the, the song. So this is also one of the oldest tradition. And Abad George, um, uh, I keep saying Abad George, Abad George is the same Both, thing. yeah, yeah. Father George, Abad George, Hiro Monk George, or Abad George. Hiro Monk George, yes, Abad George. Uh, and he's, he, he, he is known to be like a really good follower of uh, the St. Gary, the Axumite, his tradition. And he's also one of really good contribut contributors of the already existing tradition to the St. Yari. So he follows like in his lead. In his Book of Hours, there's a lot of mentioning of the, the Psalter that we have in Iraq, and a lot of the St. Yari prayers. He takes them and he makes like something beautiful out of them. Like he kind of enhances that. And then you have um, the Matins and Vespers, right? That some of the Orthodox use those terms or more simply the, the evening prayer and morning prayer, as well as some miscellaneous prayers and even you close out with prayers just for the priest that absolution or the release of god the son uh could you talk about those uh the morning prayer evening prayer and those miscellaneous prayers that you have towards the end of this book yeah for sure so um i know people uh people who already are using this book uh they call it as you know well, the Udasi Mayan book or the Theotokia book but Theotokia is actually half of the book. So the other half is completely like the morning and the the evening prayers. So one of the interesting things about the morning and evening is that the morning prayer, if you go by Abba George's version, it's gonna be a lot, a lot more good on this book. Like it's huge. You have we have like the original monastic tradition where they have like matins, right? The very morning prayer, and they got they have like the first hour prayer. Which is almost basically the same thing. Like you're not gonna have any break. You just continue through that first hour prayer, and then you have like the third hour, which is like 9 a.m. prayer. That's a different thing. But morning, if you combine the matins and the first hour prayers, they have like their own readings, they have their own hymns, they have their own songs. It's a very very large prayer. That if you take that, if you take that tradition. But what happened? Uh, I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, what happened is that. Um, I already mentioned it on the back of the book, on the editor's note. Um, there is uh, when the Italians kind of tried to conquer us successfully, um, and when in the in the second uh, Ethio Italian War, you have the the king uh, fleeing to first to I believe it was Jerusalem, and he ends up in in uh, in UK, right? And then he took a lot of monks with him, and they they have their own ark, you know, tabot, and they were doing liturgy, they were praying for the for the whole nation, the kings, and I think some of them became a bishop after the exile. Some of the monks, um, but one of the monks was that his name is Hagi uh, Gavrogiorgis. So Hagi is more like the equivalent to His Grace, 
So in the in the old days before having the patriarch, you have the patriarch, uh, you have the bishop that comes from Egypt, and you have the, this herald structure which functions very much independently without him. And it's yeah, my my family. friend even theorizes that they may have been acting as bishops themselves. So I, I looked that word up before. It, it, the original version, interestingly, is Hatsege, which means next yeah. to the emperor. And he was the abbot of Dabra Libanos. Yeah, that's where the kingdom is usually not far from that. <laughs> Even when uh, the kingdom went to Gondor, like they actually like brought those uh, Echege lines near to them, right? Usually like they're constant, but they pretty much run the church. And you have the bishop sitting and collect there. taxes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's all an independent <laughs> uh, republic. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so you have Echagiri fleeing with him, and um, he, um, they, they made like an order of prayer for the morning and uh, evening. So that's the I believe it was nineteen. Um, it was it was 1935, so the book was called Church Prayer, and it was completely in Giz and Amharic, some Amharic in it. And the order they made is like they took some parts from a a a and they took some parts from Psalms. They took some parts from later additions to a that we think are from a but are not from a And so that order is like exactly used in the book, in this book for Matins and Vespers prayer. So it's more appropriate for this short pocket size, his order, and the actual full of uh matins and evening prayer. Well, we we look forward to the short version as well as the long version that will eventually come up. That's what we're going to place our hope in. Can you make a direct plug? Where can people find Mas'afas Alot or the Book of Prayer? Yeah, uh, for sure. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, uh, it's great that people are learning about it. Uh, I'm glad a lot of people, UK, US, Canada, and people can find it on any Amazon, Amazon Australia. You can just just search Book of Prayer, or if you can use like Amharic word, that comes up, it will come up so much faster. And Book of Prayer, if you say Book of Prayer Ethiopian or Book of Prayer Masafa Salut, you can get it on any Amazon that you have in your area pretty much thank you so much and before we get you go um because we've been discussing prayer so much and saint isaac the syrian who you shouted out earlier has helped me in my prayer life greatly and so i encourage people to always read his works as well but do you have any personal advice i, I would assume the clergy who are listening have their prayer life in order i would hope at least but let's say for all of the parishioners all of the faithful and laity who are listening if if they're struggling with prayer especially during the great fast how would you encourage them to begin to pray using this book of prayer which you have uh, presented for them like do you expect them to read it cover to cover or is there a particular place that they should start off with and build from there honestly that's that's such a great question um like saying this as someone who also struggles with prayer and i'm not giving an advice that that which i have i'm not saying that i conquered the art of prayer but I'm also from a struggling brother to everyone. I would say you're starting very small, right? Like you have to start very, very small. If you are someone who never prayed, like if if, if you never prayed in your life, it's it's just it's it's good for you to start with. I cross my face, Thanksgiving prayer, Our Father, and that's it for you. Like try to be there, like present within that prayer. Not just saying it. Try to be present and say that small prayer, but also. I would suggest um, people to get their spiritual fathers and talk about how prayer life is going for them, right? I don't expect people to read through the whole thing. It will take 45 minutes if you take, if you read the whole thing. But progressing from the daily prayers and maybe someday you can do the morning prayers with the daily prayers and the uh, Desimariam, right? And someday you can do um, the whole prayer with the with the litanies and everything you can make up the like a formula that with with the help of your spiritual father but i would suggest 
to start like very, very small and go up like as much as uh, God is allowing you. Thank you, Deacon Thaddeus. Amen, amen. Thank you so much.